We come called to this place by the power of God and the insight to know it as truth and know him as our Savior. God that is revealed to us in the pages of scripture is a welcoming and inclusive God who directs us to love one another. We, receive to, we seek to remove all barriers that keep us from that love. Come now, and let's confess all that separates you from others and from God as we pray together. God of grace, we come before you Grateful for your gift of salvation, pride and risen. In our weakness, you call us. In our confusion, you teach us. In our troubles, you offer us peace. Loving Creator, Son and Spirit, we come with doubts and fears. We come in ignorance. We have failed you, your creation, and your people in many ways. Trusting in your love, we turn again to you as we open our hearts to your mercy and forgiveness. Grant us your peace. In the name of our risen Savior, amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our needs, we're given the grace to grow and the courage to continue the journey. Believe in the good news of the gospel.
to prepare our hearts for the hearing of God's word, let us pray. Gracious God, in whom all hearts are glad and all souls rejoice, show us the path of your presence that we may follow it in hope and be filled with resurrection joy. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, amen. Please read responsively with me Psalm 16, as is printed in the bulletin. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another god multiply their sorrows. They drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to show or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Will the children come forward and join me? Hi. How are you? Come on up, right over here. Hello, Lily. Hello, Lily. Hello, Joey. How are you? I see. Hi, Caleb. So, I have a question for you. You guys all know about God, right? Right? So, how does God feel about us? What? Liking us. God likes us. That's true. How else does God feel about us? He's taking care of us. That is true. Anything else about how God feels about us? He really, really likes us. He really, really likes us. In fact, I think we could say he loves us. Do you think that's true? Yeah. Does God love us? Yeah. Okay, do you know what is true? There's some people who don't know that. Do you believe that? Yeah. There's people who don't know that? Yeah. There might even be people who are in this room today who are wondering, wondering, does God love me? Is that, is that strange that there would be people here right now that would wonder about that? That is kind of strange, because we say it all the time, right? But sometimes people feel like, you know what, I did something really bad. I did something really bad, and maybe God doesn't love me anymore. Have you ever done anything really bad? No, my sister did. Okay. Um, you say no, and you say maybe she did. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. It's good. It's good. I always thought that my brothers and sisters did the bad things, and I was fine. Um, the truth is, sometimes we wonder. We wonder. Particularly as we get older, we wonder if God keeps loving us. We do. And it's really hard if you wonder about that. So today we're going to pray for those people. Would you help me pray for those people who want to know and need to know that God loves them? Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear God, Help us know that you love us. Thank you for sending Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, friends. There are two texts I'm going to share today. The first is from the first chapter of the letter according to Paul to the church at Corinth. I'm going to begin with the 18th verse. Paul says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. And in the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, this passage immediately follows the passage that we read a couple weeks ago where there were disciples walking to Emmaus and they came to recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And this passage happens just after they get to Jerusalem and tell the disciples, the other disciples, what they had experienced. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, pour your Holy Spirit upon us that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue today in the Easter season, and I have to tell you that while I loved Easter as a child because of the egg hunts and the candy, And the hats. I I wore a hat for many years at Easter. I'm jealous of the Pope. He gets to preach in a hat. I don't get to preach in a hat. And, And there were pretty shoes, and there were dresses, and there was a big family dinner. I loved Easter, but I have to tell you, Easter posed a problem for me when I was small. The church where I grew up had a framed picture of Solomon's head of Christ. I loved that picture. You know the picture. Jesus' hair is long. It's neatly parted right in the middle. There's a kind of glow about him. He looks holy. His eyes are looking up, looking up to God. In the picture, Jesus looks kind, loving, benign. He looks submissive and obedient. I love that picture of Jesus as a child, and it imprinted itself on my brain, so when I think of Jesus, at least part of the image is the one painted by Solomon still. This might be true for some of you, too. The painting was an overwhelming international hit. I have seen it on the walls of churches in Kenya and Madagascar and Ecuador, so it really got around. I love that picture. And I loved Jesus, and all the songs I learned as a child told me that Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me, this I knew, for the Bible told me so. And Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And oh, how I loved Jesus. And I loved Easter, when Jesus rose from the dead and we could all celebrate. But I like many children raised hearing stories about Jesus and his death and resurrection, I wondered a lot about God. I was scared, frankly, of God. Jesus wasn't scary, but God was. Because God was powerful and could do things to us and could punish us if we were bad. God was someone from whom we'd better watch out. We'd better not cry. We'd better not shout. I'm telling you why. God sees us when we're sleeping and knows when we're awake and knows when we are bad or good. So God was a little scary, frankly. 
And I wondered in my love for the kind, caring Jesus and my fear of the scary, all-knowing God, I wondered just what was good about Good Friday. What could be good about the day that Jesus died? How could we call that good? How could it be good to have the Lord of life, the best person who ever lived, who loved us in all the ways that no one else can love us so completely, so unconditionally, so caringly? How could it be good to have that guy put to death? The common and even popular answer to this conundrum is that it was good that Jesus died for our sins. This is what I was told. It is good because Jesus took our place and died so that we might live. This is called substitutionary atonement. Jesus substituted for us, like a substitute teacher, which I have been at some points in my life, or a substitute worker on the line when the regulars are out sick or on strike. Jesus stood in for us because our sins were so bad and God was so mad. Because God was so enraged, so filled with wrath, Jesus, the only perfect human being who ever lived, had to take on all that anger, all of that conflict between sinful humanity and a God filled with rage, all of that wrath, all of our sin. And Jesus had to carry all that on his back like a cross to the cross. He had to go through a horrible death so that God's anger would be appeased and we could be saved this is what many have said to children who ask the question. This is what many have said to people who are new to Christianity. This is what many pastors, theologians, and scholars have shared in classes and books and sermons, and there's a problem with this theory. The problem comes with how we view and approach God. In the drama of substitutionary atonement, there are three players. One, sinful humanity. Check. We can say with absolute accuracy that sinful humans can generally, nay, always be found, right? Two, a perfect, sinless savior. Maybe looking like Solomon's head of Christ, but but not necessarily looking like that, but is there a perfect sinless savior? Check. I have no doubt. And the Bible and Christian theology give ample evidence that Jesus is the perfect sinless savior. And three, a God filled with anger that has to be appeased by blood sacrifice. Wait, do we have that? Is that what we have? A God who is filled with anger? So angry that this God would send his only beloved son to die a horrible death? Is that a loving act? We say that God is love. The children were sitting right here and they know that God is love. Jesus said that God is love. Is this the act of a God of love? When bad things happen to people, a wry joke is to suggest that somehow they have angered the gods. Have you heard that? You must have angered the gods. Greek gods, Roman gods, the gods of the Mayans, or Aztecs, or Incas, for example, gods who required blood sacrifice, human sacrifice as an act of appeasement retribution for sin and wrongdoing, a way to expiate guilt. But we're not thinking about our God, our God, when we talk about appeasing the gods, are we? Our God doesn't require appeasing, right? The theologian Thomas Torrance, a renowned figure of the church in the 20th century, well worth reading or at least a review of what comes up on Google, Thomas Torrance served as a chaplain in World War II. 
He chose to serve on the front lines, although he wasn't required to do so. He told the story of coming upon a 20-year-old soldier mortally wounded who called out to him, and Torrance knelt down, and the soldier asked him, Padre, is God really like Jesus? The chaplain assured him that God was, and as he prayed, the young man died. Years later, in Torrance's parish ministry, an elderly parishioner, a woman who was close to her own death, asked the same question, is God like Jesus? And Torrance was struck with the realization that much of Christian preaching had failed the church to the extent that people, Christian people, church-going people, people who went to Bible study did not know the nature and identity of God. In response to this series of encounters and reflections, Torrance wrote, put God in heaven and Jesus on the cross allowed to die and you destroy your faith. For you cannot believe in a God who allowed that. But, and this is the gospel, put God on the cross and you alter the whole situation for when for then the cross is not a picture of God's unconcern or careless disregard. What if God put God on the cross? What if God descended and entered human life in order to transform it forever? What if through going through human suffering and death, God ended that suffering and death for all time, for all people? It makes a cardinal difference if we see God going the distance for us, God who goes down into the depths for us, God who understands our pain, our struggle, the battles of this life, because God has experienced them all and God has overcome them. It makes a cardinal difference if we see God like this. There is a song that became very popular years ago, performed by Bette Midler, one of my favorite artists, but I didn't like this song. Bet the singer is better, in my humble opinion, than Bet the theologian. In the song, God is pictured watching us. God is watching us. God is watching us, but always from a distance. But it is different. Our lives are different. Our view of God is different if God is not distant but close at hand and in fact aware of every kind of pain that we go through, every kind of pain we go through, because God in Christ went through it for us, out of pure, unadulterated love for us. Life can be a struggle. It can feel like we are at war. We can experience life as a battle, and it sometimes feels like a battle we cannot win. There are those who battle with cancer, or diabetes, or ALS, or mental illness, or depression, or debt. Many of life's struggles, many of the battles of our life, are based in a foundational sense of unworthiness. Whole arenas of disease and social dysfunction emerge from the muck of understanding ourselves as unworthy of God's favor. If we are at war all the time and we believe ourselves to be unworthy of anything better, we will be vulnerable to the belief that we were created by a God who hates us, who hates our sinfulness, who is disgusted by our weakness and fallibility, who is angry at us and from whom we must flee and hide and before whom we must cower. That is, if we believe that God is not like Jesus and Jesus is a submissive, obedient, not particularly strong Savior like he is pictured by Solomon in the famous painting who submits to the superior power of an angry and omnipotent God, then it would be 
reasonable to conclude that we are on our own, friends, that it is good, truly good, that Jesus, Jesus who loves us, this we know, Jesus who is different from God, weaker than God, and nicer than God, it is good news that that Jesus, this kindly character, died for us. But in our sorry state, we will still have to battle to gain anything. For we are living the life of humans, which Thomas Hobbes famously described as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. From this vantage point, from this twisted, distorted view of life, we can see the cross as the ultimate symbol of defeat, the emblem of suffering and shame. A sign that signifies state-sanctioned execution, wherein the religious authorities colluded with government to violently eliminate the only sinless human who ever lived, the Lamb of God, because God needed a blood sacrifice to appease divine wrath. But friends, if we instead see that God in Christ went to the cross for us, struggling in every way as we are, and overcoming sin and death for all time, and that God did this for us, for us while we were yet sinners, as the Bible said, while we were yet sinners, God did this for us, for us, because God loves us so immensely, so prodigiously with every fiber of God's being, then the hard but truly good news of the crucifixion is that the love of God is completely wrapped up in that event. The truth, the amazing good news, is that God is on our side. God is in the battle with us. God who will win every single time. Who with Jesus and the Spirit, theologians say, are dancing around at every moment sharing power and love and creative and sustaining and redeeming energy. Sharing all of these with us because of the way that God loves us. This makes Jesus call to the disciples, see my hands and feet, I'm the one they nailed up on that cross. And Paul's statement to the Corinthian church, we preach Christ crucified. This transforms these texts so that they become, as Paul says, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God in Christ entered human life and human suffering and the battles and the struggles and pain and fear and terror and division and conflict and war. God in Christ enters and continues to enter into it all. God in Christ is in it, is in human life when we are in conflict, transforming it, redeeming it, bringing new life through it, through the cross. God in Christ is in it when we are afraid, when we feel we cannot go on, when we are paralyzed and unable to think, changing our fear into faith through the cross. God in Christ is in it when we have convinced ourselves that we are unworthy of God's notice, when we see ourselves as unqualified and in eligible in any way for consideration as God's own is small and ugly and undeserving of anything but pain and struggle at that very moment, at that very moment, my brothers and sisters, God calls us and courts us like a lover and sings love songs to us and entices us, seduces us, wakes us up to our best selves, back to the knowledge of the image God has of us as the best, most wondrous creation God has ever made, the image of the beloved of God. And God does all of this through the cross. This is why we preach Christ crucified. 
because of the good, very good, best news that ever was. That God's love for us knows our trials and moves through our struggles and our pain and our death. And God in Christ brings us beyond death to new life, time and time and time again. And will continue to so love us and so be with us and so redeem and save us until time itself comes to an end. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit who died for us that we might live. Amen. Will you stand with me in body or spirit as we reaffirm the faith in which we live? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Having heard God's good news of love, let us respond in love and serve God with our tithes and offerings.
For those who have no place to rest, may our gifts provide shelter. For those who are parched for justice, may our generosity quench their thirst. For those who wander the streets alone and afraid, may our blessings provide a way. For those who are in the valleys of suffering, may we offer ourselves as companions on the journey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Fill us with your joy. What do you think? Can you say that? I was hoping to do a prayer um, answer, and it didn't get in the bulletin. So let's give a minute and see if we can do this. If I said, set our minds on heavenly things, could you say, fill us with your joy? Will that work? Let's try it. Set our mind on heavenly things. I think we're ready. <laughs> Let's have the joy of praying together as the people of God. Lord God, help us believe the proclamation of Christ's resurrection, which forms the very foundation of our faith. As the bewildered disciples pondered stories of Christ's reappearance, he crossed the darkness of their fear and doubt. When we are in distress, remind us of Christ Jesus, who makes room for us in this world and in the next. Set our minds on heavenly things. Fill us with your joy. Holy Spirit, help us love being a child of God, for there is no higher calling. Bring to us the sense of your living presence as we go into this new week. Renew in us the faith you want us to have the faith that is not afraid to reach out in your name and to share the good news that you have given us. Set our mind on heavenly things. Fill us with your joy. Lord, you know our hearts. You know our needs and you know the hearts of those around us and their needs. We remember today the family of Lyle Feller. those who are ill and struggling. The earthquake victims of Japan and Ecuador. The Anua people of Ethiopia. And Rachel and Michael Weller who work among them. Set our minds on heavenly things. Fill us with your joy. Finally, O oh Lord, we ask that you would bless us at the First Presbyterian Church with vision for the future and a reverence for the past. Be with us as we participate in ministries of healing and hope throughout, through this church, in our community, the region, the nation, and the world. Set our minds on heavenly things. Fill us with your joy. Give us courage and strength to be your disciples in all circumstances in our lives. As we pray the prayer you taught your first disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us go out into the world firmly ensconced in the truth that God loves us so that we may share that good news with people who do not know it. And now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.